People buy, and I don't fault them, they buy supplements off Amazon, but they don't realize heat and moisture are like the enemy of dietary supplements. And even a plastic bottle, it, heat and moisture still get in there. Well, it, it's moisture vapor, moisture it, vapor which okay. turns into moisture. So it's not just moisture seeping through, it's going through moisture vapor that turns into regular moisture and they're taking it and it starts to cycle. Yeah, HDPE bottle, is, it's, it's, it's better than a box, but it's not much. Mm -hmm. Glass is great, but the problem with glass, once you open that lid, you're introducing the humid air. Yeah. So it's, it's much better to either A, have it in a CSP vial, or B, work with a, a blister pack because you're only taking one, opening one dose at a time. Heat is another factor that can destroy bugs. So you wanna make sure heat and humidity is important. Yeah, not only just destroy bugs, but I've noticed um, when I buy supplements from companies that I know they're not controlling the moisture in the manufacturing process, it gets clumpy in the powder, for example. Uh, certain exogenous ketone products, I've, I've noticed that after a month, it's super clumpy. Have you worked with like the BHB, the uh, co-crystal salts? The, um, it's a beta hydroxybutyrate. Not, not the ketones, I haven't, worked, I haven't worked with those, but yeah, again, with those ingredients, they're very hydroscopic. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do, they have the affinity to take water. So they're going to they're going to find water. They're going to find moisture, either a in the ingredient or b in the atmosphere, or moisture vapor coming in. And what it does, it just starts to harden or cake, and it's called degradation. The product you're losing potency. So in today's show, we're gonna talk all things dietary supplement quality, things to consider when you open up your dietary supplement, where to store it, so as to maximize the effectiveness and stability of the products. So Daniel Gluck is a personal friend of mine. I've known him since 2012. We've worked together and he's an awesome person. He was staying at my house over the summer and we filmed this episode because he has over 22 years of experience manufacturing dietary supplements of all kinds, overseeing manufacturing facilities, doing consulting, you know, formulating, building supplements. He's just a wealth of knowledge. So, I, and he's a cancer survivor and he embarks on a low carb style diet. He exercises, he does CrossFit, and he's a father. He's just an awesome person. I think you'll really enjoy this show. Brought to you by our friends over at blueblocks.com. The blue light blocking glasses that I wear that I recommend to you. So if you spend any amount of time on computers, screens, cell phones, or if your occupation or your workplace has these big fluorescent lights, it's beaming down these artificial blue light, you need to protect your eyes because there's actually been a huge increase in degenerative eye conditions and the prevalence of those conditions, probably because we're spending so much time now under artificial lights, from screens, from tech, from computers, from cell phones. So please protect your eyes, protect your body's circadian rhythms, enhance your sleep and your sleep-wake cycles by going to blueblocks.com. And also, you can use the promo code HIH to save 15% off your next order. If you don't want to remember all that, no worries. Links are below. Just click those links and they make an awesome remedy sleep mask that completely shades out any light coming in while you're sleeping. Because as you know, just a small amount of light is enough to suppress melatonin, suppress growth hormone, and interfere with your sleep stages. So let's cut back to it. Welcome back. It's Mike here. I have my buddy Daniel Gulick. Daniel and I have been working together since 2012 in the dietary supplement manufacturing space. So Daniel knows so much when it comes to making dietary supplements, protein powders. He actually custom made his own pre-workout that I had this morning, which was, I'm still feeling it, but uh, we'll talk about what's in that. But you know, basically in this video, just want to share with you some tips about what to look for when you buy supplements, because I think, I mean, here, we're going to start with this. You know, I think a lot of people, supplements get a bad rap because a lot of companies are kind of cutting corners. I mean, you know, so for example, uh, the New York times will independently test. I think this came out last year, red use rice. And they found there was high levels of various aflatoxin and or, or uh, naringenin. What's the uh, compound in reddish rice? The the negative compound that's bad for the liver. I can't remember. Anyhow, we see these different independent studies come out, and they show that dietary supplements aren't meeting label claim. Um, what like what are some things that people should look for, and how are co how are companies like cutting corners generally? A lot of people are potentially the manufacturers are cutting corners by buying the ingredients that the customer specifically wants, but they'll bring it in and show that they brought it in, but then they'll go ahead and ship it back and then go ahead and buy another ingredient. And if there's an audit that was ever done, they would say, 
okay, look, here's my purchasing record. I did buy it. It's in the formula, but then, and potentially they are cheating the customer from that way by buying an ingredient from China when they should have been buying the ingredient from Europe, mm -hmm. buying it, then returning it and vice versa. So we just had a client. So we, we worked together with various doctors and practitioners to help them build their own brands. And what Daniel was referring to is a real life example. It just happened basically three weeks ago. We're not going to mention the company's name or anything like that. But it was a very expensive form of a raw material, a B vitamin. The European material costs around 17000 a kilo. Correct. And the Chinese stuff is roughly Chinese materials, roughly about five to six thousand. The European materials, roughly about ninety two percent. And it's a much cleaner process when they're making it compared to the Chinese material, which is roughly about 76% and is, has a high degradation. Mm. So you have to put a lot more overage than you do have the European material, correct? So let's, let's pause right there because you mentioned some industry jargon that people may not know. You said it's on, the European material is a 92%. You, you, can you define what that means? It means it's 92% it's active. It has the 92% of that one ingredient is the active ingredient, the active B vitamin mm -hmm. for that particularly chemical. And as the Chinese material is only roughly about 76%, which it has more inherent water into it, the higher water you have into a certain raw material, the more potential for degradation. So you have to put more of an overage for that material. So there's, would you say there's more impurities in there? Or it's not as pure or it's just not as potent? Is that? It's a, it could be a couple different ways. Yeah. It's a different process. Okay. So with their process, they, they, they have a higher moisture level on it. But again, moisture, inherent moisture can cause degradation for the product. Right. That's a key point I want to get into a little bit later, guys. So a lot of people, I used to do this with my supplements prior to like working with you is you, you take, you open your supplement bottle, you see the, the silica desiccant in there. A lot of people take that out because they're like, this is junk, I don't need it. But that's really important to the, the basically the potency of the product, right? Right, so what you wanna do is you definitely wanna keep the desiccant in there. And, and when you open the bottle, you definitely wanna close the bottle and keep it closed because with your products, moisture and heat are the key to cause accelerate degradation, degradation or loss of potency of the product. So shelf life for the product. So if you open it, take your product out, close it, keep the desiccant in there, it's very important. Super important, guys. Uh, especially with things like probiotics, right? Correct, with um, probiotics, and you know, with probiotics, there's new different ways that you can take care of that. Now they're putting the desiccant actually in the bottle or the vial, so it's not inside of it, but it's inside the plastic. So when you're opening and closing that one, you can actually, has, it will have the potency from day one to day 30. So what happens, even if you're having a, desi a probiotic and you're opening up the bottle, the problem you run into is that you're opening that bottle every single day. So day one, it could be 100 billion. But since you're opening the bottle, day 30, even though you're just opening and closing the bottle, introducing the moisture into the product, that last pill could only probably be about 50 billion, even less because of the degradation, your, the water goes into it, it lives its life cycle and then it dies and then you're, you're gonna have loss oh, of good. potency. So new concepts away for packaging that are coming out in the near future, instead of putting it in the fridge, you'll have a inline CSP vial, which is the desk in around inside the vial. Built in, Built which into is the plastic. really cool. Um, what so like methyl B12, folate? What are some other nutrients? Are herbs sensitive as sensitive to moisture as like probiotics and stuff? Yeah, or? what happens with herbs is they'll 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 take the moisture in and then you'll it'll harden or crust up and then you it, again moisture is the killer and heat. You add them both together and your potency, especially if it's an extract level for some in, some 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 type of uh, herbs and whatnot herbs. Uh, what will happen is degradation yeah. and, and if the potency is 30 percent you know maybe in a couple months it's going to be down to 10 percent or something like that wow and so that's sometimes friends when you when you get a pill or something and there's moisture in there like what you're talking about you'll see the uh the cat like the material will contract in the capsule so there's space there so what's happening is uh, it's absorbing the moisture and it's hardening and it's hardening inside that's what's happening with that so it's just moisture vapor. It's not just, it's not moisture from there. It's called moisture vapor. Mm. So part of that is from the manufacturing environment. And so one of the things that we've done here at Myosciences is work help with Daniel's help is working with a manufacturer that controls humidity right. during the manufacturing process. So that when you're making these things and encapsulating them, you don't have a, a really moist environment. Right. So a good example is if we're, wherever you're manufacturing a product, 
uh, humidity control and temperature control is the key. Humidity control is probably number one. The reason being is, again, moisture. Once you get moisture added to a product, you have the, the high potential for degradation. So you want to work in an environment that's roughly 30% or, low, or lower. And a lot of people just say, why don't you just you know, manufacture in a desert? But the problem with that is people use regular AC. So AC is for creature comfort which is 50% humidity. And when you're manufacturing in that type of environment, it's much too high. So when you want to manufacture products, you usually want to be 30% or lower. If you're doing probiotics, 20% or lower. Mm, that's key, guys. So the, I mean, you've audited how many facilities? Hundreds? I wouldn't say hundreds, but, but definitely- Probably not hundreds. Probably, probably about 30 or 40 different companies I've been to. How many would you say are in the US? 75 maybe? Meaning manufacturers? Like dietary supplement manufacturers? I mean, you've been to a lot, oh, large percentage. It, in the U.S., I'm going to say there's probably close to a thousand. What? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so you've seen some good stuff and some kind of shady stuff. Well, you know, it's it's really grown. I started, been in the business since the late 90s, and so I've seen uh, the dietary supplement grow and grow and grow. And, you know, it, grew, it started with people doing stuff in the garage, manufacturing in the garage to now where the regulations with the CGMPs and the FDAs more involved, that now they have to have a quality system. So, you know, a lot of those people will go from the garage to a facility if they can do it, but it's just doubling and doubling and doubling every single year. Mm -hmm. But it's probably gonna start cracking down with the FDA coming, coming after people, uh, with the 483s and shutting people down, that only bigger players and people that work in from their garages aren't gonna be able to do it anymore. Which is probably good because the quality control in a garage type setting is probably not. You know, one of the things you talk a lot about is blend uniformity. So if you're not blending products, let's say, for example, a nutrient like selenium, mm -hmm. which can be toxic in high levels, right? So you're taking a multivitamin, there's not enough blend uni uniformity. Let's say one capsule. Can you talk about kind of the, how blend uniformity issues translate into inconsistencies in capsules and the variants in the nutrients that are... Right, so selenium, you're talking, you're working with the microgram level. You're not working with milligrams or grams. So, and if you go over, I believe it's three milligrams, you, you have toxicity with selenium. So what you wanna do is you're only working with maybe 45 micrograms of the material. Usually, maybe it's a 1% or 3%. So you're only putting about two or three milligrams into a product. So what you have to do is with the blending procedure is you have to do a pre-blend or you have to up-blend it. So you, you add it to another ingredients more like a, a vitamin, a small pre-blend of vitamins and minerals and blend that together, then up-blend it and then up-blend it again. So when it comes out from a blend uniformity standpoint, when you're looking at 15 micrograms, it's gonna test consistently at 15 micrograms with mm. the other ingredients. That's one of the a marker ingredients that uh, the labs use to, to say, okay, yes, if there's something's in blend uniformity, they'll pick something that's very low and something that's high and test that and test that. So one of those is selenium, but it's a difficult ingredient to test as well. I can imagine. That's a good point. So when it comes to finished product testing, I think the perception, and I used to think this too, is every micronutrient that's on, say, a multivitamin is tested for. But like you're saying, that first of all, that would be cost prohibitive. Companies that say they're doing that, it's do you think they're really testing every single ingredient if they have like 30 ingredients in a formula? So probably what, here's what they're doing. If you're following the regulations is probably for the first three lots, yes, they have to test every single ingredient that's on there. And then what they're, that what they're able to do after that is to do a, a skip lock testing or B, look at, don't look at if you have 45 ingredients, you're just looking at lot one, you're going to test for say, Two, two vitamins and two minerals, and you're gonna test those in that lot. The next lot, you're gonna take two different vitamins and two different minerals and test that lot. The next lot, you're gonna do that. As long as you show a testing procedure for the FDA and then your SOPs and you're following those guides or Bible or exactly what you're stating on paper, mm -hmm. the FDA is gonna be fine with that. But usually the first three lots, you have to do full testing to make sure that you are compliant. I see. So that is so it is cost prohibitive. I mean, to launch a product, there's a lot involved if you do it right. Well, a good example is uh, if you do a, a multivitamin. Say you have 45 ingredients, and you're only doing about 1,500 kilos, which is maybe uh, 1,500 kilos is maybe only about 
four thousand bottles. Mm -hmm. But that fourth, that testing for forty-five ingredients is going to cost you about fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So it's going to be cost prohibited to test every single lot right. that way. So that's why you have to come up with a testing plan or testing procedure, and make sure it's compliant with the FDA. And when you get audited, to make sure that FDA is happy with it. But that you have to show your due diligence, your stability testing, and everything to show that a the product does have it and you have done it on at least three lots. Mm, yeah, that's a uh, really good point. Um, you know, in the industry, I think people have talked about how skip lot testing is kind of a negative thing. It's a way that these big companies cut corners. Um, the former owner of Thorne used to talk about that a lot. Um, but it's kind of a standard industry practice, would you say? I mean, a lot of people... You know, saying skip, you're, skip lot testing, it, it, um, if, if, say, they tested the same lot, yeah. 10 times in a row and they test the vitamin C 10 times in a row. So then they, they said, okay, we've already uh, say, Hey, this, our blending and our blending instructions, our bottling instructions, everything's good. Our uniformity is good. So we're going to just do it every three lots. So they've challenged it or validated that. Yes, you can do skip lot testing. As long as you validate that with the formula, you're okay. Okay. That's, that's a good point. Um, what are some of the steps that when you get incoming raw materials, so, so batch to batch or lot to lot on a certain product, you're going to be getting new incoming raw materials. Let's say theanine or let's say taurine or maybe even uh, a protein naturally occurring like pea protein, right? There's going to be a little bit of variance. So what are some things that good manufacturers should be testing for like when they get a new raw material? So when you look at for testing procedure and what the FDA requires, so what the FDA requires is a, anything that's coming into your facility, you have to do identify, identify, identification testing. So with identify, you have to identify that ingredient is a pea protein. So there's different markers you can look at. So if it's like an, a pea protein, you can test for the protein content. You can also test for the pea content, just for pea. Mm -hmm. So, but what else you, you have to do is you have to do assay of that product at least three lots a year that come in, you have to do a full assay on it. And whatever the full assay is, it's exactly what you write in your specifications for that raw material. Because every raw material that comes in has to have a written specification from our, the quality department, specifically saying this is everything that needs to be tested on that raw material. So you have to test full testing three times. And then after that, you can do identify, identification testing. But the majority of companies that are nowadays are doing more due diligence and actually doing full testing on every single lot that's coming in. Mm, that's good. So the lot comes in, you want to do identification testing, and more or less you have to look at, A, what the raw material is. So if it's, if it's a pea protein or something, you definitely have to do heavy metals on it to make sure your arsenic levels are low because those kind of can be out of range for Prop 65. Mm -hmm. Then you wanna look at the micro, you wanna make sure there's no contamination because with, that's a happy medium. If you want something to grow, there you go. It's yeah. gonna grow on a protein source and right. water source. So those are the main things you have to test for. Interesting, so every lot, like good companies are doing this with every incoming, even if they're remaking the same formula they've made before, they're doing a lot of upfront work to make sure that Correct. It's not messed up. And they're, they're not only doing that for the raw materials, they're also going out there and looking at the manufacturers of the raw material, the vendors, not only distributors, but the manufacturer of the raw materials. They're going to them and auditing them and making sure they're doing a risk development to see if they're going to be a high risk or low risk. And that's going to tell you how much due diligence you have to do for testing as well. So it, there's kind of a, it's over the, all over the board, There's depending de depending on who your vendor and who your contacts are. Yeah, At, have you done some of that raw material vendor type uh, evaluation and vetting? Correct, okay. what, the first thing you'll do is, it's called a GMP questionnaire. So you're gonna go ahead and send out that GMP questionnaire. It, it's probably about 14 or 15 pages. That's something that everybody will go over. They'll do it, it's like in a self-evaluation. And then you'll take that self-evaluation, you'll review it, then you come back, you ask them any questions. And then the next step that is you do a go ahead and you do a physical GMP audit of the facility. And with that physical GMP audit, you're going to go off their self evaluation. And then a, you want to do horizontal and vertical assessment when you're going there. And what I usually do is when I'm going to do an audit, I just follow the process all the way through. 
exactly how it goes from start material to end material, start of the product to the end, and go all, all the way in between and ask questions. And the biggest thing is you want to hit with auditing is training and making sure everybody's following their SOPs. Mm -hmm. For biolatches like ashwagandha, different herbs, I don't know, do you have a favorite herb that you like? I'm not a big herbal guy. Herb guy, okay. Mostly aminos. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about your pre-workout, which is really cool. So, so for herbs, some companies will use like uh, benzene toluene solvents like to extract the herbs and, and stuff like that. Uh, other companies use like a CO2 extraction or cold water extraction. How much of those residual solvents end up in the product? Well, see, that's, that's a part of a qualification of the raw material. What you're going to do is uh, residual solvents. You're going to look at that and there's a threshold and usually it's 10 ppm. So you're going to look at that and part of your full testing is actually to test for residual solvents. So you'll look at that. So potentially it can be in there or not. It all depends. And with herbal extracts, a lot of it's alcohol, methanol. Ah, uh, got it. Extract That's not too bad. Which is not terrible. You're not seeing benzene. You're not really seeing anything like that. Right. So it's mostly an alcohol extraction. The CO2 is mostly that's with fats. So speaking of fat, there's a fatty acid that's utilized to help reduce friction and heat in manufacturing, magnesium stearate which for folks that may not be aware, uh, steric acid is the most abundant fatty acid in the entire animal and plant kingdom. It's in breast milk, it's in chocolate, it's in walnuts, it's in olive oil. But certain companies tout themselves and pride themselves in not using magnesium stearate, yet they use like ascorbyl palmitate. They'll use leucine, they'll use other things. Let's talk about why any of these fats are needed, even MCT oil, right, is used in manufacturing. Why do you need some of that lubrication? So what you need is a lubrication. It's mostly going to be when you're running on high speed machines. So you're not going to sit there and fill a capsule by hand one at a time. A, it's going to be very slow and B, you're not going to have a consistent fill capsule to capsule. So everything's run on high speed machines. Usually the machines are running roughly between 40,000 capsules per hour or tablets going all the way up to 200 to 300,000 capsule of tablets per hour. So to run at that, you want to reduce the friction. And so what the, the, the mag sterate, what leucine does, what ascorbyl palmitate does, it's a natural fat. It helps lubricate the product and also lubricate the machine. So as it's going through the machine and filling the capsule and cutting the capsule or dropping the capsule in, you're not having any residual powder sticking onto the machinery. Because when that happens, when the residual powder sticks on the machinery, it gradually accumulates. So then eat, you potentially you could have your less fill on your capsule or overfill on the capsule. The machine will stop and then uh, you'll have poor production. Mm. So that, that's why it's needed. But you know, if somebody wants a clean formula, it's definitely possible to do that nowadays with uh, just different excipients, which we do all the time. And as long as you're working in a low, humid uh, manufacturing environment, you can pretty much run anything, anything because uh, you're having moisture is not accumulating on the machine as you're running. No condensation is happening on the machine. So you're going to run a lot cleaner. So again, I know I stress moisture a little bit, but low humidity is very important in the manufacturing process. That's key. How many low humidity or how many humidity controlled manufacturers are there, you think? Uh, true, true, the full facility, true humidity control. Uh, I would say probably 10 years ago, there was probably about one or two. So nowadays, I think, you know, especially with probiotics being more prevalent, I would say there's probably about 10 to 12 companies out there that full have humidity control. With humidity control, you know, it's going to, with a facility, say about manufacturing facility, you're trying to control about 30 to 40,000 square feet. That adds about fifty thousand dollars a month just to control the humidity. Oh my gosh! So, so. it's a very expensive endeavor, but Correct. the product is really high quality. But the thing is, the, the, the reason why I wanted to have you on, Daniel, and I'm grateful that you're here, is to help people understand this because I think th this can become complex. People are just looking for magnesium, or they want zinc, or they want to sleep better. They don't realize that all the behind the scenes, what goes into manufacturing, and it's really important for how effective their end product is. So you're saying that cost. So a manufacturer that wants to really, like Zymogen, for example, and wants to really do high quality stuff, it's costing them 50K a month just to control the humidity. Just to control the humidity. That's nothing else. Because what it's doing, it takes the air, it dries the air, either with gas or electricity, it dries it and then it cools it back down. So it's, it's a couple processes, just not taking the air outside and cooling it. So there's more 
process involved in it. Is it just like a big old desiccant? It's a big, huge desiccant wheel and it's, it's running very hot. So it just burns all the water and then it just shoots the air back and cools it back down and shoots it back into the facility. Wow. But as someone like a, a manufacturing supervisor, manager, you know, role that you've been in and so forth, um, you love being able to manipulate the humidity because it's just a cleaner process when you're making the... I'll tell you what, it's easier on the employees when you're running the machines because once you add moisture to anything, you, it starts a sticking process. And once you have a start of a sticking process, there's a couple ways to fix it. You add more excipients to it. And most silica. people don't like it. Not, it's silica is just helping for flow. Mm. You're going to add more mag sterate to it or silica to help the flow. Less friction. You know, that's what silica does. Mm. So a drier environment, the, least, the less excipients you're going to need and the cleaner the product can be. Yeah. Really good stuff. And again, for moisture sensitive ingredients like probiotics, because you mentioned that. And then um, a lot of people, when they take a probiotic on that topic, they'll uh, look for things like having extra inulin or FOS. Now there's different forms or there's different moisture activity levels in those different ingredients. You want to talk about speak so that? So the important thing is when you're working with probiotics, you it's water activity. And so that's the affinity of the ingredient to take the water from another ingredient. So a good example is the probiotics, it has a very water activity is very low. So it's usually anything that's higher than 0.2 mm -hmm. that will take, it'll take the water from that ingredient because it, and there's inherent water in the ingredient, roughly two or 3%. It's normal, yeah. any type of raw material. It'll take that, it'll start its water, it'll start its life cycle and die. So you want to be below 0.2% on the water activity to make sure that you're going to have a viable product. And obviously you want to keep it at a a lower temperature or room temperature and you know again there's there's new ways out there to lower the water activity even after you make it the new uh, CSP vials as I talked about earlier with the CSP vial with the desiccant in between so that's going to constantly be drying it because the silica in the walls is will has more affinity to take the water away from the ingredient than the probiotic so it's going to take the water first before the probiotic can take the water and it just stays in there and it just silica. stays into the silica wall Correct. that's cool new csp vials we don't have at my own sense we don't yet have any products with that but we do offer the probiotics in a blister pack do you want to talk about the advantage of that well the blister packs it's an aluminum it's called aloe aloe with the aloe aloe and we're shooting nitrogen in between so there's not going to be when you're shooting nitrogen in between and aloe aloe your your pocket of the air in there is just nitrogen there's no air there's no water so and then you have aluminum top and bottom and it has like a plastic to make sure you're not going to leach any aluminum into the product. Mm. But you have a seal on top and bottom. And with that, your water vapor is going to be at 0 0.00001, meaning almost nil in a two or three year period will moisture vapor be able to get in there to start any type of water activity. Your environment inside that little cup is all nitrogen. There's n there's no water or no air in there. There's no humid air in there. So your product's going to be pretty stable. Wow. Even in a hot facility like an Amazon fulfillment center or anything, because those they probably have the swamp coolers, like you said, cooling those warehouses. And a lot of people buy, and I don't fault them, they buy supplements off Amazon, but they don't realize heat and moisture are like the enemy of dietary supplements. And even a plastic bottle, it, heat and moisture still get in there. Well, it, it's moisture vapor, moisture and, vapor which okay. turns into moisture. So it's not just moisture seeping through. It's going through moisture vapor that turns into regular moisture and they're taking it and it starts a cycle. Yeah, HDPE bottle, is, it's, it's, it's better than a box, but it's not much. Mm -hmm. Glass is great, but the problem with glass, once you open that lid, you're introducing the humid air. Yeah. So it, it's much better to either A, have it in a CSP vial, or B, work with a, a blister pack because you're only taking one, opening one dose at a time. Heat is another factor that can destroy bugs. So you wanna make sure heat and humidity is important. Yeah. Well, not only just destroy bugs, but I've noticed um, when I buy supplements from companies that I know they're not controlling the moisture in the manufacturing process, it gets clumpy in the powder, for example. Uh, certain exogenous ketone products, I've, I've noticed that after a month, it's super clumpy. Have you worked with like the BHB, the uh, co-crystal salts, the... Um, 
It's a beta hydroxybutyrate. Not so. not the ketones. I haven't okay. worked. I haven't worked with those. But yeah, again, with those ingredients, they're very hydroscopic. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do, they have the affinity to take water. So they're going to they're going to find water. They're going to find moisture, either a in the ingredient or b in the atmosphere or moisture vapor coming in. And what it does, it just starts to harden or cake, and it's called degradation. The product you're losing potency. So when you open up your supplement, you know, and you see it's clumping. That also means that potentially what you think you're getting is maybe not there because it's starting to degrade. It's, it's degradation. So yeah. definitely what's happening, if you get a product, it's clumping, you see shrinking in a capsule, moisture is, has invaded the product. And with moisture, it's causing degradation. So you can, unless the company is compensating for a, a humongous overage, it's going to be less than label claim. That's a great point. Um, is there an industry standard? Well, maybe let's define what overage is in different things. And is there an industry standard to do overages and do certain companies do more or less? Uh, there's not an industry standard. It's just something that, that working with the product, doing stability testing, uh, you know, every, every product's different. Every combination of ingredients are different you sometimes you have to put more vitamin C in one formula than you have to put in another formula. So there's no really set rate, yeah. but you go off of, uh, you know, been working in industry about 23 years. So you have an idea working with, you know, thousands and thousands of formulas I work with the year. You have an idea what overage you want to put in the formula, you know, for vitamin A, you're going to put in 25, 30%. But if you're adding C to it or something else, maybe you need to add a little bit more beta carotene. So each formula, and then when you run a pilot, and then when you do the first three lots, you're doing the stability testing on that, the first three lots. And with that, you're gonna learn, A, look, in this, in this formulation, at this time, I'm gonna have to put more overage of this ingredient. That's why it's very important to do the due diligence and do the stability testing and the validation testing. Yeah, what about, when it comes to probiotics, well, a customer of ours recently discovered this when he was reformulating a bunch of probiotics. He realized that certain companies are not putting in the, the amount of overage. Or, or basically what they're doing is, say you get a probiotic that's a proprietary blend. So there's like 20, whatever, seven strains, right? What they're, they're suggesting is, um, you know, hey, I know you really like strain one, two, three, and four, but strain five is very stable. So let's load up the probiotic with strain five and then put pixie dust of the other ones so they're on the label, but they're super expensive. So yes, yeah. so that's very frustrating. And yeah, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some probiotics like LA-14, the DuPont strain, you know, bacillus spores, which are very, you know, resilient. So the, they'll last much longer heat and moisture both. So what people do is, and, and I'm saying big companies too, not just the little people, not just Schmo, Joe Schmo, but a lot of companies are doing exactly what you're saying. They're loading up on the, the very stable ones because when you do testing, you're only doing enumeration testing and you're looking at the whole probiotic blend. You're not looking at each specific strain. So you're looking at the total probiotic not individual strain. Until they start doing individual strains, uh, I don't see how you're not gonna, that's not gonna happen. Yeah, that's kind of a shady thing that, uh, it seems like a lot of companies are doing that. Uh, I would say there's a, <laughs> I would say that there's a plethora of companies doing that, if so, not all of them. That's just too bad because people are paying top dollar for probiotics and so that's why, you know, we partner with Zymgen because if you look at uh, the probiotics that we offer, they're parsed out strain specific. So you know exactly how many milligrams of each strain you're getting. And it's not just this proprietary blend where, hey, this strain's very stable, but we know you want these other ones that are unstable. So with that, you know, on, on, let's say um, the How Are You Biff strain, Bifidobacterium lactis HN019, or uh, Bifidobacterium longum HN019, I believe. Right. Uh, the How Are You Biff strain. So it's got a lot of published research on how it affects the immune system, TNF alpha. Uh, innate immune system signaling, right? It's very unstable. So you have to put in like 300% overage on Roughly that? we're putting in about 300% overage on that ingredient just because of that. And still we're also packaging that product into an aloe oil blister because of that. Because you want, you want to give the best chance for your product to survive. And you want to make sure when that customer takes that product at day one, or day 600, mm -hmm. they're still gonna have the same potency, 100 billion or 30 billion. Yeah, you, you mentioned something there about two years roughly. Is that the rough, I know every ingredient is different in a manufacturing environment, but about two years, is that a, a good expiration date? 
that's or, pretty much a normal expiration date and that's what everybody shoots for is a roughly a two year obviously retail what they like to do is say three years because when you when you sell a product in retail the, sh the stores want at least a year shelf life when they get it in case it's sitting on their shelves for a year so two years is a pretty norm but with probiotics and some ingredients that aren't as stable uh, 18 months Mm. is normal as well 18 months to two years what are those ingredients that are kind of not so stable the probiotics it's a, it's it's just shelf life what what happens with a probiotic is you have a die-off rate mm. say you you're at a hundred percent 10 billion usually by eight months you're going to lose about four times that so you're going to be about two billion two and a half billion but then after that it's very very stable so it dies real quick and then it's stable like that so that's why you put such a big overage but again New technology, new packaging technology with the blisters, you know, doing the nitrogen purge with the CSP vials. With that, we're able to keep that shelf life. It's going to now with that, it's going to be more stable because you're not introducing any moisture to the product. Yeah, great point. A uh, few final questions here. This has been awesome, Daniel. I hope people are enjoying this content. And if you do, please hit that like button. That helps our videos, our channel, and more people that are interested in learning about this. Um, you know, one thing that, that I think is unique is a lot of people are taking MCT oil right now, MCT oil powder. And sometimes if you look at the, the label of an MCT powder, it'll say, let's just say hypothetically, it says five grams, MCT oil, five grams. But if you look at the fat content, it'll say like two grams. So you're like, wait, how is there five grams of MCT and there's only two grams of fat? What, what's up with that? So what's, what's happening is uh, MCT oil, is a, it's an oil, obviously it's a liquid. So if it's in a powder form, they have to spray dry it on something. So what, what, what a normal, either they'll do it on maltodextrin or acacia fiber. That's pretty much the new thing that everybody's using. So when they spray it, you, you can only load so much of the oil onto a powder. It's only going to soak in so much. So it's usually about 50%. So you usually have a 50% oil. 50% of the fiber powder. Mm -hmm. So they're saying it's just five grams of MC to MCT oil powder. So it's, it's, and, it, and it's roughly only two to two and a half grams of the actual oil. Right. So it's a little loophole, you know, something when you're purchasing your MCT oil powder, you, you want to look for that. Make sure that the fat content matches the actual, the fat, the fat content is what you're really getting. And if, if the MCT oil powder says more, it's because that company is listing the fiber plus the oil content, but you're not really truly getting that much fat. Right, so always just remember, when it says MCT oil and it's a powder, you're, you're only getting roughly about 40, 40 to 50% of that is actually oil. Mm -hmm. So the acacia, what, what is acacia? Acacia fiber, it's just, it's a, it's a fiber. Okay. But it's a, it's a good fiber for you. Yeah, that's great. Um, so when it comes to collagen, are you more excited about bovine collagen or now the fish collagen? Uh, you know, fish collagen's more for beauty, and uh, fish collagen has less taste to it. Uh, me personally, I take the bovine, the bovine collagen, but the the fish collagen is uh, probably double the price, and they say it's a it's a better grade. Mm. Interesting. I wonder what kind of fish that is coming from. Is it? I, I'm not sure. Happy I would salmon. I would have to look. I'd have to look. <laughs> no, up. I know. They'd have to be pretty, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I mean, what's what? Daniel's in a unique position because you get a lot. Of, you can get bulk raw materials, and you make your own stuff. So um, maybe this is something that we can come out with a mile sign, something like this. But I took it this morning, the pre workout that you made, and uh, so downside is not everyone has the access, you know, to do this sort of thing that you made. But maybe people can learn from from what you found to be pretty effective, and I feel like right now, like my brain is really focused. Um, there's some nootropics in there, caffeine. You want to talk about your custom pre-workout? So, the, you know, again, I really didn't take supplements until I actually started working in the industry roughly in the late 90s. And then over the years, you, you learn new and new things. Uh, like, you know, I used to be just, oh, creatine's it, yeah. and then whey protein. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot more. So uh, I put a lot of stuff into my powders, and I make them fresh every single day and uh, so what I'm putting in is a whey protein, a casein protein, I'm putting in D-ribose, I'm putting in taurine, citrulline, arginine, beta alanine. Mm. Oh, beta alanine causes the, uh, the, the kind of feel of the itchy, the, itchy, yeah, the yeah. flush, the little bit of flushing if you feel like your ears are flushing and everything. Uh -huh. And then L-carnitine 
And Which then, form, the tartrate or the uh, I'm actually using the base, but oh. it, it's better. It, it depends on what you're looking for. I'm also, with the new atropics, I'm starting to add nootropics to it. I, it. Really, I do CrossFit. So what that does is it makes me focus a little better, a bit better. So I put the alpha GPC, I put mm -hmm. the phosphatidylcholine in the product. Uh, I add the caffeine to it just because I like the little more the push. I add L-threonine to the product and a new product called Dynamite. Okay. I add that to it for the nootropics, and uh, it's a good synergy of all those. And I just, when, with my workouts, I really work out hard, and then I, I'm able to just focus. focus all the way through. And I have enough stamina from all the supplements I'm taking to last for my good 40-minute hit class. Yeah, at 49 years old. I'll be 50 on Friday. Amazing, man. You do not look 50. So what you're doing is really working. Perfect. Um, so what about the post-workout? So you got a little whey protein in there. You got some collagen. I'm pretty much doing the same thing. I'm just not adding the nootropics. So I have pretty much the same mix. Mm -hmm. I just don't add any caffeine to the product. Um, and I don't add any uh, the nootropics to the product. But it's, it's pretty much the same as the pre-workout. Yeah. And what it does is, especially if I do it, you know, like you're almost throwing up type of thing, to go ahead and start taking that and then a little electrolytes and you're all good. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you add electrolytes in there too? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. I would love to come out with something like that. But, you know, it's hard to trust some of that. What about acetylcholine? Have you used that? The, I haven't used that before, but it's more, you know, the, the choline by tartrate doesn't pass the blame barrier, but the city choline does. So. Mm -hmm. I heard it's a great ingredient, but I don't have a lot of uh, experience, experience or data for you on that. But the Alpha GPC, what are you running in that? 600 milligrams? 600 milligrams. Yeah. So I know there was a, I don't know if you, do you remember Robert Crayon? Yep. Crayon Research. So he passed away, unfortunately, in 2000. Did he really? 2010, colon cancer. Yeah. I did not know that. All right. Yeah. Um, anyway, but he was big on uh, the, the Alpha GPC. So he had this Alpha GPC. It was, a, it was a, like a little tincture kind of thing in plastic. You peel it off in 600 milligrams. But I felt like I could really notice that. I'm telling you what, uh, you know, the older you get, you forget little things, yeah. but like I said, it helps you focus mm -hmm. even with work, even afterwards, you know, taking all these supplements, especially for the nootropics, I, I feel more mental clarity and yeah. I, I have more focus. That's cool. Yeah. I think a lot of people could benefit from that. Daniel, thanks so much for coming on. It's been great to work with you, you know, since 2012, we've yeah. learned a lot. Um, I've learned so much. I feel like I'm now, and I try to share this with people, and I don't know that everyone's so interested in the manufacturing nuances, but I think if you're gonna take dietary supplements, it's worth learning about so that you can make better decisions, better choices when you purchase your ingredients and stuff like that. Um, and I don't know if you're comfortable talking about it, but you're a four-year cancer survivor. You wanna? Yep, so uh, I found out about four years, I had pneumonia, and my doctor said, did a four-year panel for my blood. Oh, let's run your PSA. My PSA came around 60. It has to be less than four. Went to the urologist. The urolo urologist said, okay, let's do a biopsy, which I do not recommend to anybody. Let's just say it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. I mm -hmm. uh, found out I had three small tumors there, so I said, cut it out. Yeah. So I uh, got it cut out, so three years, and everything's great. That's awesome. Now, what are you doing any follow-up tests for that with the urologist you got it so i do it's a psa test so and with the psa test it, it's just a since you don't have a prostate anymore instead of being less than four it has to be less than 0.5 okay so it's just much lower you're looking at the, the detection limits much lower yeah 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 and then um you've been low carb for three years i stopped eating bread i still drink beer but mm -hmm. i stopped eating bread so i've been low carb for about three years yeah Good for you, man. How have you noticed going low carb affecting CrossFit? Uh, you know what? I have a lot more energy, uh, especially on uh, the AMRAPs, and then you're doing the longer, longer runs and stuff like that. I definitely have a lot more energy. I, I did notice I went to the Cayman Islands and pretty much ev bread with every meal for a week. I came back completely bloated. Mm -hmm. Took me about two days of just my back to my normal diet. So uh, you definitely see the difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing we didn't talk about as you were talking, you reminded me of branch chain aminos. Do you take those? Five, th those are in the ing my. Uh, I, ha I probably have about 15 or 16 ingredients. It takes me about 15 minutes a day just to make my pre and post workout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I put about five grams of BCAAs in there a day. What I can do is I'll give you a list of everything and you can share with everybody. We'll, we'll share it there. Yeah. yeah. And then if people have any questions for Daniel, I'll, we'll be following the comments here. 
Uh, really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you get updates when we launch new videos. And appreciate you all tuning in. Appreciate your time, Daniel. You bet.